Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. <sighs> Sorry, I, I hate to cut off fellowship. That's kind of the point of church. But we are streaming, and so uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Good to see everyone this morning. Uh, we're going to be continuing our uh, focus on what does it mean to be people who practice peace. Uh, and I think the, the reason that's so important to me is most often I think of peace as something that just happens to me. I kind of run into it, and uh, I don't run into it enough. I'll just say it that way. I, I need it, as, as I said last week, as I've gotten older, I think more and more if you ask me what do you want to experience in your life, I think near the top of the list would be peace. And it is difficult in a world like ours to experience peace as often as we need to if it's just going to accidentally happen to us. Um, and so uh, I want to just quickly recap what we talked about uh, last week, which is that we need to learn how to experience a kind of peace that's possible and sustainable even when our lives and our world are anything but peaceful. And I, I know that's kind of a stressful way to describe our world, but I think it's probably, uh, unfortunately, pretty accurate uh, that we increasingly have a world that seems to be at odds. It may primarily be that technology allows us to see all the lack of peace uh, all at once in a way that we couldn't see it before, but we are more and more aware of, of all the ways that our world is anything but peaceful. And so we talked about the truth that this kind of peace takes practice, and m maybe more than that, it is a practice. Um, it's something that we're going to have to to try our best intentionally to cultivate in our hearts and our souls. Uh, the good news is we can cultivate this kind of peace, um, but it's going to take work. And, and one of the things that I want to say real quickly is, the reason you practice something is to get better at it. And if you beat yourself up because you're not automa automatically uh, exceptional at something and you quit because you're not, you know, I think, I think often of parallel parking, which I used to be better at before we moved to Abilene because we just don't really have to do it that often. Uh, and I want to just be magically good at it again. Uh, and as, you know, our daughter Riley is getting closer and closer, shockingly enough, to Lauren and I, uh, to driving age. And we're talking through, okay, here's the stuff you're going to have to to be good at in order to pass the driving test. I'm, I'm like, I think I'd need some practice to, to brush up on my driving if I had to do a driving test like the one she's going to have to do, right? Um, parallel parking, you don't just do it. You have to practice it. Uh, and if you're in a busy downtown, I don't know if you've ever been in a stressful situation trying to parallel park, but you may start to try and then someone pulls up and you get stressed out and you have to drive around the block uh, to, to try to start it again if you're feeling too anxious about it, right? That's, that's how anything worth doing in life works. You have to keep trying and there's going to be times you, you do everything you can. Uh, to pull it off and it doesn't work out and you do it again. On the other hand, I want to remind you that people who are the best in the world at various skills don't get, th they, they don't get to a point where they stop practicing, right? There's a, there's a football game later tonight that I have a little too much vested interest in and I'm on the wrong side compared to everybody else here, okay? <laughs> I'm going to keep my mouth shut. I'm especially going to keep my mouth shut if the Niners win. I'm not going to say anything next week. If they lose, I'll probably crack a joke at our expense, okay? What do the best athletes in the world do the day after a game if they can move? They practice, right? And what do we learn when we, the, the best, at the, the best of the best, all, all the time you hear stories, they spend more time practicing than almost anybody else, right? So, this isn't a matter of saying we're going to get to a point where it's just automatic. It's still going to take focus, and it's still going to take practice. It's, it's never going to be something we don't have to think about, okay? So the key thing there is don't get discouraged. Don't decide that because you're not automatically amazing at this that you're just not cut out for it. 
it's something that's supposed to take work. Um, all the best things in life that mean something take work. Okay, now real quickly, uh, we walked through Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 13 together. And it's, it's one of the more well-known passages in the Bible where Paul's talking about this peace that passes understanding and the Lord is near and, you know, focus on whatever is true and noble and beautiful. And, and so we read that together. And here were four kind of practices that surfaced from that text. Share your concerns with God and entrust your concerns to God. We talked about the fact that we don't want to just kind of have this sense of anxiety and fear and, uh, you know, being overwhelmed, we, we need to take the time to name it, uh, to, f- to try to figure out what it is that's causing us to not experience peace. And then once we're able to name it, we don't just have our minds and our hearts just going in circles around the concern, but we try to entrust that concern to God. Make the choice to focus on traces of God's grace and goodness. A lot of us are kind of conditioned and hardwired to notice what's not working, where things aren't going the way we want them to. There's always those places in our lives. But there are also traces of God's grace and goodness that we can see, that we can hold on to. And we're going to talk more about this this morning. I'm not saying that you ignore the more challenging aspects of your life. I'm saying don't let those be the whole story. Practice the way of peace by imitating people of peace. All of us have folks in our lives who, when we're around them, our heart rate actually slows down. You know, we can just feel it. They calm us down. Uh, And and there are things those people do that we can learn to do. And if we decide it's only superhuman people who can experience that kind of peace and cause other people around them to experience it, then... We're going to kind of ride ourselves out of any sort of experience where we get to follow in their footsteps. So what can we imitate in those people? And then finally, keep remembering that the peace of God comes from God, not from what is going on in the situations we find ourselves in. We tend to always want peace to come from the outside. And when I say the outside, I don't mean God. I mean the outside world and the situations we're in. And if we need for everything to be going the way we want it to go in order to experience peace, we are deciding ahead of time to be disappointed and resentful. We just are. Okay, so that's what we talked about last week. This week, I I want us uh, to focus on our conviction that God's peace is for us. That it's not just for other people, but it's for you. And as we look at Scripture, we find that living a life where we get to experience God's peace is a consistent promise throughout God's Word. Go all the way back to Leviticus 6. The Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron and his sons, this is how you are to bless the Israelites. Say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. How is God gracious to us? Right? The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. In Judges, Gideon, whose life story, if you know much about him, has a lot of ups and downs in it. Gideon's not exactly the guy you want to be exactly like. It's kind of like Samson and some of the other judges. When Gideon realized that it was the angel of the Lord, he exclaimed, Alas, sovereign Lord, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. And he lives with conviction that if you see God face to face, you're going to die. Right? But the Lord said to him, peace, don't be afraid, you're not going to die. So Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and called it, the Lord is peace. You know, there's all these people in the Old Testament giving God new names based on the experience they have with God. This is not a name for God that I often think of. But I find deep comfort in the fact that one of God's names is peace. To this day, it stands in two words that I can't pronounce very well. Okay. Psalm 29. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. Okay, it doesn't say the Lord sits enthroned over a peaceful day where everything's going the way we want it to go. All right, he's, in, he's enthroned over the flood. Or maybe the worst thing you can imagine happening. Right? 
The Lord is enthroned as king forever. The Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with peace. And then in Matthew 5, 9, Jesus says, Blessed are the peacemakers. You know, you diff- look at different translations, it says they'll be called children of God. The whole point of that is they remind, there's a family resemblance of a heavenly father who's peace, right? That they're recognized as his children. That, that the same kind of peace that people experience in God's presence, that's the peace that we're supposed to help other people experience through us. And as you've heard in various places, you, you can't share what you don't participate in. You can't give what you don't have, right? And so if people are going to experience God's peace through us, the first step is for us to be people who get to taste and experience that peace as well. Learning how to breathe slower and deeper is an essential step to experiencing peace within the present moment. Just bear with me for a moment. We're going to kind of veer away from Scripture into science for uh, just a few minutes. There are people getting ready for a uh, uh, potluck after church for the college students. So if you're not in the college ministry, you're not invited, which I'm trying to get over. But that's why you keep hearing that, uh, that garage door thing make that noise. Okay. According to the Harvard Health Publishing, the stresses of everyday life can cause us to gradually shift to shallower, less satisfying chest breathing. Breathing deeply can be something we have to relearn how to do because shallow breathing limits the diaphragm's range of motion and the lowest part of the lungs doesn't get a full share of oxygenated air that can make you feel not only short of breath, but anxious. In contrast, Deep abdominal breathing encourages full oxygen exchange. This type of breathing slows the heartbeat and can lower or stabilize blood pressure. Anybody in here have their doctor tell them you need to lower your blood pressure? I had that fun conversation just recently. 44, goodness sakes. Okay, James Nestor and his book Breathe, or Breath, sorry, says the first step in healthy breathing extending breaths to make them a little deeper, a little longer. When we breathe like this, we can better protect the lungs from irritation and infection while boosting circulation to the brain and body. Stress on the heart relaxes. The respiratory and nervous system enters a state of coherence where everything functions at peak efficiency. Just a few minutes of inhaling and exhaling at this pace can drop blood pressure by 10, even 15 points. Okay, Now, you didn't come for that. Right, you didn't come to Bible class for the Harvard Health whatever and James Nestor. Here's where I think the connection starts to matter for us in a Bible class. In Peace is a Practice, Morgan Harper Nichols says, breath is similar to the word wind in ancient Hebrew. It's not just similar, it's the same word. Right? Breath can also mean wind or spirit. This is what breathes life and animates dry bones. Breath is more than just the inhales and exhales that leave our bodies. Breath is a force connecting us to life. To see the importance of mindful breathing, we have to think of our inhales and exhales as something bigger than us. We have to see our breath as something that not only keeps us alive, but also links us to all other life. It's what connects us to everything from the ground beneath our feet to people we interact with each day. Okay, so if you you take this idea that science tells us, hey, it's actually good for you physically to slow your breathing down, turns out that God, the author of life, this is so often what I find to be true, what's good for us in one way can be good for us in other ways too, right? We find that in terms of (coughs) doing the work of forgiveness and extending grace, right? It's it's actually good for you, not just spiritually, but physically. Um, Same is true with breathing. Uh, And the image of breath is central in scripture in a lot of different places. In fact, if you go to the very beginning, right, Genesis 2, the description of the creation of human life is connected to God's breath, 
right? This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. On the day the Lord God made earth and sky before any wild plants appeared on the earth and before any field crops grew because the Lord God hadn't yet sent rain on the earth and there was still no human being to farm the fertile land. Though a stream rose from the earth and watered all of the fertile land, the Lord God formed the human from the topsoil of the fertile land and blew life's breath into his nostrils and Adam came to life. Okay, now, same kind of observation in Job. You don't have to know a whole lot about Job to know he's almost never having a good day. <laughs> right? His life is being dismantled by difficult, not just difficult, but things that he cannot fully understand. He can't get his heart and his mind wrapped around what's happening to him. It's not fair. Doesn't make any sense. And it's not just that he's suffering physically. He's suffering in the deepest places of his soul. And as he's praying to God in Job chapter 10, he says, Remember that you made me from clay and that you will return me to dust. You clothed me with skin and flesh, wove me from bones and sinews. Life and kindness you gave me and you oversaw and preserved my breath. Right, my spirit. Later in Job, by the way, there's not a single friend in Job that's right about almost anything. <laughs> they try their best, but they're trying too hard to explain to Job why his suffering is deserved. And it isn't deserved. So God's going to come in at the end of Job and say, all of your friends who tried to help you, they were wrong. They were wrong about me. Um, they were wrong about why you're suffering. Okay? But one of those guys who shows up is named Elihu, son of Barakel, the Buzite. He says, I'm young and you're old, which is not a great opening line if you're trying to comfort somebody. I'm young and you're old, so I held back, afraid to express my opinion to you. I thought, let days speak, let multiple years make wisdom known. But the spirit in a person, the Almighty's breath, gives understanding. The advanced in days aren't necessarily wise. The old don't always understand what's right. Okay, So back to this idea that the essence of life is somehow connected to this breath of God that breathes into us. Another somewhat familiar passage to many of us in Ezekiel chapter 37. This is where the dry bones ministry gets its name from. The Lord said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the Lord's word. The Lord God proclaims to these bones, I'm about to put breath in you and you'll live again. I put sinews on you, place flesh on you and cover you with skin. And when I put breath in you and you come to life, you'll know that I am the Lord. Okay. One important way for us to practice peace is to learn again how to intentionally inhale and exhale, to take in and let go, to receive and release over and over throughout the ups and downs of life, right? And I'm talking not only about slowing, physically slowing down and breathing. By the way, if you've never done this, there's really simple ways to, to try that out, right? There's four, seven, eight breathing that, that people recommend, which is where you inhale for four seconds, you hold it for seven, you exhale for eight. Uh, there's four, four, eight breathing, where you breathe in for four seconds, you hold it for four seconds, you exhale for eight. Um, I, we were recently traveling, and uh, our daughter Reese was having a lot of anxiety before we were getting on the airplane. And I just decided to try it since I was studying, literally studying for this class. I thought, well, maybe I should actually see if this helps. So I walked her through 448 breathing. And in the course of two minutes, I watched her change just from slowing things down and breathing. Um, it helps even further, I think, if you add, you've heard of uh, possibly the idea of breath prayers where as you breathe in, you, you say in your mind one half of a statement from Scripture, and then as you exhale, you say the second half. You can pick any Scripture that you find comforting. Sometimes I just think I'm breathing in God's grace, and I'm breathing out 
my grudge, right? Or I'm breathing in God's healing and I'm breathing out um, whatever's bothering me. Um, however you do that, God partners with your heart rate and your blood pressure and all of those things that happen to you on a much deeper level, right? And so if we can then start to think all of life at some level fits in with this rhythm of taking in and letting go, right? That that's not just something that happens with breathing. It happens with moving through life and relationships that we're constantly given opportunities to receive and to release. Um, and that here's the problem, is if we try to live a life where we're only taking in, or we try to live a life where we're always just letting go, right? That's an imbalanced life that's unsustainable. You have to figure out the rhythm of life, of giving and taking. That's true in church, right? It's true in community. If you enter into a relationship and you're only focused on what you can get out of it, it doesn't work. And I will say, if you live in a relationship where you're only giving, eventually you're going to spend yourself to the point where you can't, you can't make it work anymore. Or you start to resent how much you're trying and the other person's not trying at all. Right? We need balance in our lives and in our relationships. Okay, so it's just the digital clock. It's not really 3.42 uh, in the morning or the afternoon. I want you to, to think about these two different ways for us just to keep track of time, okay? Now, increasingly, I've noticed uh, that reading a circular clock is a skill that takes a little bit of effort. And that since we have access to digital clocks, less and less people opt for having to take a second to read a circular. How many of you prefer digital clock over circular? Or no? How many of you like circular over digital? Okay. Probably, probably a generational break to some degree. Now, I don't want to overthink this, but I do think that the digital clock represents a way of thinking about time that has consequence, which is it's always linear and it's always moving forward. Okay, and a circular clock reminds us, and I'm not saying you have to use a circular clock to remember this, I'm saying it can remind us that even in the course of the day, we're kind of coming back around the, we're coming back around the bend, right? That that's, that there's a shape to our day that's unavoidable, right? That, that we know that whatever's happening right now in any given moment is not going to last forever and that we're going to come back through experiences that we've had before that we might want to avoid, but they're coming anyway. It's just a part of life, right? And that circular watch is actually coming from an even older technology, right? The sundial which is a way of tracking time that's completely dependent on the passage of the sun. And so it's, it's this reality that we would love to live lives that just move in one direction and are always getting better and are all, there's only good ahead. And there's, but, but the reality is you and I have been through tough times before and we're going to go through tough times again. And instead of behaving as if we can just move forward, what would happen to us if we could spiritually try to prepare ourselves for the inevitability that those difficult times will come again and we can actually be cultivating our souls and our hearts in a way where we are better equipped to withstand that because we know it's coming, right? That takes an honesty that I think requires some strength. It's easier to just avoid it and not think about it and hope that the rest of your life is only going to be fun and exciting and engaging and exactly what you want it to be, that's not the truth. And it takes a certain amount of maturity to admit that. The rhythm and repeated cycles within each day remind us all that our lives are always a mix of light and shadow, right? Sunrise and sunset. You don't get angry. Now, you may, 
but it's, it's fruitless, right? It's a waste of time to get angry at the sun for going down at night. You shouldn't be shocked. It'd be like you suddenly shouting, it's getting dark. What's happening? Why is it getting dark? It's sunset. That's why it's getting dark, right? And you may not be a morning person, but that sun is coming up. And it's interesting, you know, when you, you read the Old Testament, there's this worldview that it's not just some scientific laws that require the sun to go down and come back up. God calls it to go down and come up, right? And so there's a connection to the first day, the first morning, and the first evening, that those things don't just happen because they have to happen. They happen because God calls for those things to take place. And even though we might be someone who, you know, I can't imagine, you, I, I've only seen it in, you know, movies or TV shows. Those people that live so far north that there's times of the year where it's dark like 23 hours a day. And then vice versa, they get to the summer and it's like 11 o'clock at night. It looks like it's noon. That would mess me up. And I am not, I, I don't love every mo- moment of the day equally. You know, but there's something to the rhythm of the day that I need, um, even if parts of that day aren't exactly what I would choose. And if we think about our lives in that same way, I think we then are able to accept our life as it's coming and to not demand that, that it go only the way we want it to go. I've said this before, I'll say it again, there is nowhere in Scripture we're promised the life where it's only what we would want it to be. What we're promised is a God who journeys with us through not just the light moments, but especially those shadow moments that we face. And we have to decide whether or not we, f- we can find comfort in that promise. And not just in that promise, but in that experience. Okay. In Ecclesiastes, I want us to read this. I know a lot of us have heard this before, but I want you to pay attention to how cyclical this sounds. Now, before I read it, I want to remind you that the writer of Ecclesiastes is not saying there are, there are times when these things should happen. He's just saying there's times when they do, right? There's a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens, a time to be por- born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. Not very well, uh, if you're me. A time to scatter stones, a time to gather them, a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to search, a time to give up, A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. Now again, you know, you don't want to use the shadow side of Ecclesiastes 3 to justify hate. But you also don't want to use the light side of Ecclesiastes 3 and say, my life can be the the first half of every single one of these verses and nothing else. No, because there's a rhythm rhythm to life. And it's a rhythm that you and I might want to run away from, but that doesn't stop it from coming. It doesn't stop it from shaping our experiences. And so when we try to run away from it, we may be able to put it off for some amount of time, but inevitably we're still going to have to deal with How am I going to relate to God and to other people when something happens or I'm in a season of life I would never choose for myself? Who am I going to be then? How am I going to feel not only about God, but how am I going to interact with people who happen to be around me? If we lose our ability to breathe deeply in our souls, when we find ourselves once again moving through shadow moments, we will lose our peace on a regular basis rhythmic basis. You could set your clock to it, in other words. We're going to lose it. However, if we can learn how to hold on to our ability to breathe deeply in our souls when we find ourselves once again moving through shadow moments, we will find that we are not alone and that the light is still there. 
It may not be as strong as we want it to be, but it's there. And there are times, in fact, when the darkness causes us to appreciate the light that we would otherwise take for granted. We need the light in a different way. In the book, Try Softer, which is a, a phrase that stops you, <laughs> or it stops me, because I'm always trying harder, right? Andy Kolber says, suffering is not isolated. <clears throat> it's common to all humanity. And when we recognize that we are not unique in our experiencing of suffering, we are more likely to see ourselves as worthy of compassion in those moments, right? We don't, in other words, we don't beat ourselves up. Um, we don't, we're not hard on ourselves because it's difficult. We are also less likely to feel as if we're alone. Instead, we feel more connected with the human experience. I think one of the reasons that God allows us to go through shadow moments is because people we love are going to go through shadow moments too. One of the meanings, in other words, that we can build out of difficult times is to be God's presence to someone else when they face it. I'm not saying that's the only reason you and I go through difficult times, but don't waste the difficult experiences you've had. <laughs> if you can use those experiences to be good to someone else in a unique way when they go through it themselves. Uh, I mentioned last week that, uh, you know, when I was just about uh, to turn 30, I found out, I thought I had a kidney stone. I did actually have a kidney stone, uh, but I also found out that I had testicular cancer. And, you know, Lauren was pregnant with Riley, and we weren't sure we were ever going to be able to have another child. There was all kinds of stuff. And I was angry at God for letting that happen to me. But I also want to God on my side, so I was pretty careful <laughs> on uh, how I was talking to God at that point. And one of the things that uh, happened in the wake of my treatment, m my uh, cancer was found extremely early. Uh, and so, so thankfully, I went through some uh, surgeries that I needed to go through, but I've been cancer-free from the first day that the doctor found something. All right, so, but I'm a worrier. And so, you know, I don't know, do, do we have any other cancer survivors in here? Okay. The, the next time, like once, once the doctor tells you, right, that you're cancer-free, there's this weight that's lifted, right? But then the next time your elbow feels, feels weird, you think, is that, did I just bump my elbow or do I have a tumor on my elbow, right? Like, there's something that happens to you. And I, I remember talking to a doctor in Dallas, um, and in fact, he, he primarily does breast cancer surgery. That's all he does all the time. And he told me, Jared, I promise you, there's going to be a day when this is not the first thing you think about when you wake up, and it's not the last thing you think about when you're trying to go to sleep. And when he told me that, it was early enough, I thought, you don't know what you're talking about. But thankfully, he was right. Now, one of the, one of the things that happened at that church was in the wake of me discovering that I had cancer and being treated for cancer and then being healed of cancer, every time someone in that church found out they had cancer, guess who they wanted to have lunch with? Guess who they wanted to talk with? Me. And guess what topic was the last thing that I wanted to think about? Right, especially the first year or two after. I, the last thing I wanted, in fact, I, there were times I literally would be asked to go visit someone in the hospital who was having treatment for cancer. And I would, I, I went to the exact same hospital I was treated in. And I did not want to go in there, and I didn't want to sit in a hospital room because I would flash for a second and feel like I was in the bed again. 
And as hard as that was, and as cowardly as I am, I was so thankful that me just being in the room brought them hope and some sense of peace, right? That it was worth me reliving something I wouldn't want to go back to. But I've gotten to a point in my life where one of the things that I'm convinced of is why would I waste (laughs) the wisdom or whatever that I earned by going through that if I could be living, breathing hope to somebody who's scared, why wouldn't I, d- why would I ever withhold that from somebody, regardless of what it costs me, right? I don't believe this, and we can have this conversation later because I know some of you strongly disagree with me. I believe that God has the power to control everything that happens to you. I just don't believe that's how God uses his power, okay? I don't. There's lots of reasons for that. We can have coffee and we can debate scripture and everything else. I just don't believe that God micromanages everything in the world. On the other hand, so in other words, I don't think you can blame God for all the pain you go through. But I will say this. We have a God who doesn't waste the pain we go through. And we shouldn't either. Um, And so if we're going to live in a world where we know we're going to face shadows and other people we love and care about are facing shadows, instead of being angry beyond reckoning that they're happening or resentful to God that they're happening, what if part of what we do is try to search for that light and to be that light for the people who desperately need something to hold on to. I mean, usually it's not that we need something to hold on to. It's we need someone to hold on to. And so I just, I want to remind you of that, that the things you've gone through before, the scars that you're bearing, I'm sorry that you're bearing those scars. I am. But you're going to run into someone who has a scar, a, a wound that matches your scar. And you can help them if you won't run away from them, if you won't run away from that moment. And it takes courage, but it's always worth it. We can tell the truth about our suffering and shadow moments when we can also trust that those moments will come to an end. Had a professor named Dr. Seibert uh, at ACU who died of cancer, who used to say all the time, there are really bad things in this life but the worst things are never the last things, right? The worst things are never the last things because of resurrection. Do we believe that's true? If we believe that's true, we can tell the truth about the hard things, the dark things, the moments that nobody else wants to talk about or face. There's always a light that breaks through and carries us through. Christ can breathe his divine peace into us when all we can manage to do is keep on breathing. I want to end with two passages from John that say that directly. In John 14, when Jesus is talking to his scared, confused disciples because they've been with them for three years and now he's just made it clear to them, he's been dropping hints the whole time, I'm not going to be with you forever, but now he says, I'm, I've got to leave. All of this I have spoken while still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. And I don't give to you as the world gives. In other words, I don't give it to you just to take it away. Don't let your hearts be troubled. And don't be afraid. Now, he says that here, and you might think, okay, that kind of sounds like a spiritual Hallmark card. Like, what, how are you going to back that up, Jesus? Well, on the other side of the cross and the resurrection in John 20, it was still the first day of the week, that evening, while the disciples were behind closed doors because they were what? What did he just tell them in John 14? Don't be afraid. Of the Jewish authorities, Jesus came and stood among them, and he said... Let's say it together. Peace 
be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. What does he still have? Scars. When the disciples saw the Lord, they were filled with joy. And Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. Okay, I'll read the rest. As the Father sent me, so I'm sending you. And then he what? He breathed on them. It's the same breath from Genesis 2. Right? He breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they're forgiven. And if you don't forgive them, they aren't forgiven. That's a sermon for another day. Jesus wants to breathe peace into you. And another word for the peace.